All yours. <laughs> oh, thank you. Look, it's a, it's a real pleasure to be here. And I want to start with uh, some big thank yous. Thank you to David and to the department for, for hosting this event. And it's uh, and thanks also, I, I want to welcome my partner in crime, Sue Wright, who, apologies, she can't be here in person, but she's online uh, in Copenhagen. Um, and also thanks to Alice uh, to, for offering to be uh, uh, also a, a discussion. For so this is a book uh, called Audit Culture, How Indicators and Rankings Are Changing the World. We thought long and hard about the title and moved away from that, but came back to that because there is a book called Audit Cultures. It was edited by Marilyn Strathburn, and it was about um, accountability and ethics in the academy. But we deliberately chose audit cultures, uh, audit culture in the singular, to to suggest that this is a phenomenon that, um, that is something that we need to get our teeth into as educationalists, as social theorists, that there is something, there's a family resemblance of what's going on here. Um, the, the way we've conceived this is that Sue and I are going to do a, a double act, and she's going to kick off, and then we'll hand over to me, and we'll do the, 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 the not the Chris with you, the, the somebody with you and say, David, next slide, if you don't mind. Um, and I'm going to hand it over actually to Sue to kick off and uh, with the first slide, which is perhaps the, the, the obvious uh, um, slide to, to begin with, which is the question, what is audit culture? Sue, are you there? I am. Can you hear me? We can hear you. You're a bit faint. Well, so are you. <laughs> <laughs> That's fine. It's fine. I'll, I'll turn you up. I think we need to up, up. Can you hear are. me now? Yeah, yeah, I'm just going to try and get the slides into slideshow mode as well. Yeah, but um, do carry on soon. Well, I need to see the first slide, please. Yeah, move on to the next the first slide. Okay, is uh, that one there? No, no, that one. That's it. What is all it? Next one. Yeah. Can you see that soon? No. Nope. Um, we can see it here. It's up on the the board, but I I can't. I'm not able to um move my uh. This one is not responding. No, it's because um, it's what is. Hang on a sec, while um, we uh, sort out the technical. Well, somebody is saying that my audio is very clear online, so that's good. <laughs> it is, but we. Uh... You can't get it on your phone. Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, mute. Okay, try again. That's the third slide. Can we go back one slide? That's it. Great. Sorry about that. Good. Okay, so what is audit culture? Uh, we've got two nice pictures here. One is the rubber stamp and the other is the person trying to climb out of the barcode. Um, but the, the way we think of audit culture is it's a misuse of accountancy and metrics. Um, where governance is based on numbers in case, instead of professionalism and morality, to put it bluntly. We, quoting ourselves, we say audit culture refers to contexts where auditing has become a central organizing principle of society and where life and work are increasingly structured through the techniques, rationalities, and language of accountancy. And one of the things that we emphasize throughout the book is that accounting and accountancy is being elided with accountability. And we want to make that distinction as very different things. And also towards the end of the book, we then make an argument about we need accountability as part of democracy, but that isn't the same as the accountancy, which we show has got quite corrupted and is in fact often undermining democracy. So I think that gets us a start, but we'll we'll develop the idea of what is audit culture as we move through these slides. So Chris, over to you with the first example. Thank you, thank you. I guess the, the, you know the, the the only gambit is always the question for social scientists. I can't hear you at all. You can't hear me. No, well, I can if you shout. Yeah. I will shout. Okay. Come on, come on, come on. 
pleasure to David and uh, talk. So, so, so the opening question is always, you know, so why does this matter? To, to whom is this important? What, what's at stake here in, in the rise and spread of audit culture? And I've, I've got five key things that I, I think um, uh, are, are significant to this. The first is that, I mean, it, it's really, as Sue said, it's about com conflating, aligning accountancy with accountability. And one of the effects of this is that you've led to the kind of the replacement of professional judgments with simplistic metrics, reducing complex decision making, really to a kind of like an economic calculus based on um, really based on matters to managers and to bean counters. I, I think it was Robert F. Kennedy, uh, Robert Kennedy, who famously said about GDP, it measures everything uh, important except the most valuable things in life, you know, like love, trust, um, virtue, and, and so forth. Um, so it's a measure of market transactions, output, and spending, but but not the, the things that make life worthwhile. And when you su substitute trust for in regimes of inspection, of control, and surveillance, and really what you're doing is creating a, a regime of, it's a Foucauldian regime of panopticism of scrutiny inspection but almost like it, it, it leads to a regress of trust because you you no longer trust your professionals you have to uh, verify everything that is is done and said and of course this leads to the rise of, of managerialism and regimes for uh, at a distance control which again further erodes autonomy self-governance and as Sue mentioned it, it, it undermines democracy um, the, the slides we've got here, as you see, there are there's two slides. One is the the famous um, 1979 General Motors Chevrolet Malibu, and uh, th th this was a, a story re recounted by Joel Bacan in his book The Corporation. And what he he revealed in that, or it came out in the courts, is that the, the crude, simplistic metric economic calculus of auditing was applied in the case of this new model. It had a fatal flaw. The petrol tank was at the front of the car and the, the, the barrier between the, the chrome front of the car and the petrol tank was too thin. So that what would happen on collision, the car would explode quite often. Um, and this happened with a, a, on Christmas Eve, a young a woman with three children in the back stopping a, a, a railroad crossing, a car smashed into it, I think it was in, in the back, sorry. Uh, the car caught fire, the children were severely disfigured. She took a case against it and it, it came out of the woodwork that lots of other uh, purchasers of this car had had the same problem. During the court case, it was revealed that the, um, the, the, the engineer who designed it said, yes, we were aware of the flaw, but we had made the calculation that um, Assuming that there would be 240 or so fatalities per year, the cost of compensating the victims of that uh, was measured and found to be actually, rather than recalling all the vehicles and replacing the faulty engine, we were going to make a saving of $6 per car by not fixing the problem. Uh, and it's a kind of nice example of the the banality of evil. And this was 1979. And you'd think, you know, this logic of auditing and, and economic... Uh, calculus. You think we would have got beyond that, but no. 2014, Toyota were caught fiddling with a problem with their high-end luxury Lexus car that had a sticky gas pedal. That when you, it, it, quite a few people died because you couldn't stop the car from accelerating, and they wouldn't admit to the problem. And then, of course, 2015, the famous. Um, diesel gate Volkswagen scandal where engineers were told EU regulations on diesel car pollution are coming in, find a solution. They did, which wasn't the environmentally for anyone. It was to come up with software that would recognize every time the cars were being tested and it would cheat the system. Um, so we talk as well in the book about why it matters. Is that Audit culture has perverse effects. Um, rankings and auditing leads to all kinds of weird behaviors like gaming the system. It leads to a culture of compliance like these engineers in this story. To, it doesn't create transparency, it creates more opacity because people start finding devious ways around the problem. 
And of course, it leads to increased uh, stress and, and anxiety because the audit mechanisms are deli deliberately internalized so that you know we become to be the bearers of responsibility. Uh, and it's what Wendy Espeland and her colleague Michael Souder called engines of anxiety. Um, so, and the third, the, the fifth and final reason is that audit culture is leading to kind of the global ascendancy of accountancy firms and the spread of what we call audit capitalism, which is an, a version of capitalism that's not so far removed from surveillance capitalism or vulture capitalism, but it has distinctive features that are wrapped around the, the, the proliferation of, of accounting uh, and accountancy. So let me hand over to Sue for our, our next slide. So I think you've covered the that points one. that were here, so we could move on to the next slide. Great. Yeah, the next one. So one of the questions that we ask is, well, how did we get here? Um, and it's interesting because it seems to start, these processes seem to start in education, move into the military, move into private corporations, and then come back as many people in universities know, to be devilous with things like the REF and the TEF and the KEF and I don't know what else you've got in England now, but we've also got a series of things like that in Denmark. So it starts with this guy called Sylvanus Thayer, which is a lovely name. In 1815, he went for two years to study at the French Ecole Polytechnique. Um, and two years after that, in 1817, he became the uh, rector or the superintendent of the West Point Military Academy in the US. And he instituted a system there, which he brought from France, where all aspects of performance were constantly measured, evaluated and recorded. So all the students had weekly and daily tests, in fact, two kinds of tests. One kind of test which was based on their knowledge, and these were people who were being trained as military engineers. Um, so they, they had a lot of technical knowledge to acquire, and they were examined on a daily and weekly basis to see whether they'd learnt the stuff and were given a seven-point numerical scale on their performance. But at the same time, there was also a seven-point uh, qualitative scale like good or okay awful for their behavior so they were measured in two ways each day and those reports then the grades were then um, turned into reports which went up to the uh, hierarchy of people managing the school and everyone uh, was um, monitored and knew what their grades were and knew that their final grade as they graduated from this school would be the determinant of what kind of job they would get and their grades would carry with them throughout their lives. So it was really affecting their whole career, what grades they got. And they learnt reflexively how to manage a large organisation by having clear control uh, mechanisms coming down the hierarchy and clear reporting mechanisms turned into numerical grades or, or um, one word grades moving back up the system. And these graduates became the managers of the new US corporations. They, um, they ran the US armories, they ran the railroads and they ran the emerging US corporations at that time. And they instituted this kind of system of daily, weekly, monthly grading of output from each individual and each unit, and then getting reports from uh, on each unit that they could then um, compare them. That so they generated a currency for comparing the unit. Um, and as uh, the authors that we're drawing on here, Hoskin and McVie, say. Each person felt the eyes of the company always on them through the books. So this was a system of uh, performance management and behavioral management 
that was instituted from the military into the corporations. And if I could have the next slide, please. Of course. Yeah. And one of the organizations that really uh, drew on this was the Ford Motor Company. And Ford, at the same time, uh, was introducing a system of breaking the production of a car into very small elements in a production line so that each element could be costed and measured uh, for its efficiency and effectiveness, economic effectiveness. And in the 1940s, uh, I don't want that. Yeah. In the 1940s, um, Ford um, brought in some whiz kids from the Army Air Force statistics team, one of whom was Robert McNamara, who can, you can see on the telephone there. Um, and they introduced uh, this system of uh, even more um, linking this reporting system to, to the, um, the mass production of the Ford car. And in 1950s, Robert McNamara became the president of the Ford company and brought in IBM computers with their spreadsheets and performance targets and bureaucratic task-driven um, methods of seeing who was doing what and setting up a very competitive system where every small unit within the Ford Motor Company had a task, uh, performance indicators, and were competing with every other for achieving or exceeding their, their uh, performance indicators. And so they be, the managers of these uh, units began to game the system. They subverted the quality controls to meet the targets. So eventually competition and intrigue outweighed the quality of the car or the satisfaction of the customer. And as uh, Ford was going downhill, as a result, McNamara became the Secretary of Defense under President Kennedy. And he then transferred this system of um, counting um, and using numbers to judge performance as a way of running the Vietnam War. So um, the, there's a... We, we found some uh, sources which said that he judged military victory in terms of meeting quantitative measured targets, and especially in terms of body bags, body counts. And yet, as this source told us, these body counts were no compensation for the profound ignorance of the history, culture, and politics of Vietnam. So according to all the measures, America was winning the war, but they couldn't find the Viet Cong, let alone defeat them. And so this gets called a conspiracy of illusion, um, where the, the, the numbers have taken over from actually what's going on in terms of a war. If we move to the next slide, Just as um, the private sector and uh, the Ministry of Defense had discovered that these ways of running an operation were a failure, um, these, me these numerical measures were transferred to the public sector in the 1980s as a key element of new public management reforms. And over the 1980s, in Britain under uh, Margaret Thatcher and uh, in the US and elsewhere, the performance of schools, hospitals, and most public services were reduced to a number and ranked in league tables. And this led us to ask, well, why? I mean, we know this system has its faults, so why bring that in? And it really is, I think, because... It's a very powerful tool for management and, and government. government. Um, the ranking or the performance indicator is used to allocate funding. And then that one mechanism can have effects across three different scales. 
And we saw this in Denmark when um, what was called a, a bibliometric uh, forcing indicator, an indicator for um, yeah research uh, output. Um, all of our outputs, all of our publications were either measured as grade one or grade two. And then we had to input them all into a computer system. And then somebody allocated points to whether we were grade one or grade two each to each publication and then added up all the points. And then the number of points that the university earned was used to allocate competitive funding between the universities. And then the management of the universities used those points for each faculty or each department to allocate the funding between the departments. And everybody within a very short time knew that these, um, these measures counted, even though we knew they didn't matter. I mean, they weren't really you, you had to publish where it counted rather than publishing in the kind of way that you wanted a public to read your material so what the the point here is that one simple mechanism like counting and allocating points for each publication we produced can have effect across three scales it's very very efficient way of managing and governing one measure can reorganize a whole sector in pursuit of competitive advantage. It can get the organization to repurpose itself around targets and incentives. And then every individual is impelled to concentrate on what counts, even if it doesn't, isn't what matters. So that's see, you, we see then the introduction of this system into new public management in the public sector. I think I move over to Chris at this point. Yeah, so you might ask, you might ask yourself the obvious question: given these sort of rather sort of deleterious and perverse effects, why on earth has this system not only survived but but thrived? And I think the, the question we ask, and we we ask this a lot in the book, is who actually benefits from the spread of audit culture? And of course, one of the main candidates has been the um, the rise of the global accounting industry and. Uh, the big four, KPMG, PwC, Deloitte, and EY, feature prominently. These are the international accountancy firms. Uh, accountancy has become, I mean, from the 1980s onwards, it became one of the fastest growing sectors or industries in the world. Um, our book is already out of date. I think we, we tried to give some figures about how large, how many people are employed. Um, they operate across 150 countries. In our book, I think we said said that, that they uh, their revenues were um, something like uh, they uh, 134 million uh, billion, billion. Mm -hmm. in uh, 2017. It's now 200 billion. Now, just to put that in context, that's larger than the G GDP of uh, Hungary, Ethiopia, Slovakia. You know, that, larger than the, the GDPs of, of some major mid-level players if it were a country it would rank about 50 second in the terms of its wealth um can we have the next slide yeah. oh so no actually i'll keep that good i just want to say um they also have created this new form of organization mm. it's one of the highlights in the book that it's it's a, an unusual kind of corporation that it's a it's a delegated form i mean what happens is kpmg in the UK is not the same organization as KPMG headquarters in Switzerland or in the United States. Mm -hmm. they, they united under a shared brand uh, and they claim to share the same values and ethics and training. Um, and so of course, it's a way of limiting liability for when as frequently happens, they're found wanting and uh, legal action is taken against them. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, and here's some of the examples. So the big four, the, the, these are the, the, the biggest of the big four is, um, it's Deloitte, you know, with a, a mere 64.9 billion. Uh, th these figures came from uh, this year and they, and they reflect last year's. And you can see. Uh, but what's also interesting is the way in which um, these companies now using audit as a kind of entry into a company because by law, 
one of the, the reforms in the 1980s is that by law, every organization, university, school, charity has to be audited by a professional auditing firm, giving these companies a guaranteed market. Uh, and as a result, they grew, but they also used their entry point through audit to offer all these other services. And today, audit is a very small part, it's less than a third of the revenues that these companies gain. They get much more money by offering uh, advice on tax. And, and here's just a list of them. I mean, they, they now offer services in AI, the art market, the automobile industry, IT, HR, organizational planning and restructuring. And here down below, this is this was on PwC's website, 22 other industry sectors covering everything from communications, energy, chemicals, entertainment, financial services, transport, and so on. Um, let's mm -hmm. move on. Other beneficiaries as well. But we, we try to look at some of from the, the sublime to the ridiculous, but we don't have a, spend a lot of time discussing the, the ranking and rating agencies, but organizations like Moody, Standard & Poor, and Fitch, it sounds like a very sort of Charles Dickens set of characters, isn't it? A lot of Moody and Fitch. Um, yeah, they set the standards or the ratings of the credit worthiness or uh, of of whole countries, and it really matters if you get a if you drop from a AAA rating to an ABB or junk status, it affects your entire ability as a country or as an organisation to borrow. Um, we also spend quite a lot of time thinking about the the university or, or rating agencies, the Shanghai um, and the uh, the GOG and the QS that come out with these annual ratings and rankings uh, of universities. And of course, they keep proliferating. We've got the, the best, most recent university, the best universities for innovation, for entrepreneurship, uh, for impact. And now the, I think the most the most recent iteration is, is for sustainability. And we have a whole chapter dedicated to the OECD. Um, which uh, particularly in some of it sort of, uh, it, it constructs statistics on, on members' progress in becoming knowledge economies. But uh, as all of you who sort of work on schools will know, PISA, the, uh, the International Student Assessment, uh, assessment uh, rankings and ratings, have a huge effect on governments. They call it the PISA shock when suddenly the results are produced and it turns out that, you know, you thought you were excellent in providing mathematics training and teaching for your students and no, you're overtaken this year, it's career, next year, it's it's uh, Finland and then the year after it's on. And, and Shanghai. Shanghai, yeah. We've had that one. Um, so these lead tables plot how countries are going up and down. And of course, they they bid and compete to, um, to, to outdo each other. Okay, next slide. And then other beneficiaries, of course, are management consultants. And we devote a lot of attention in the book to looking at the way in which the private finance initiative created in the UK by the various conservative governments, and then which morphed into the PPPs, the public-private partnerships, um, how these were brokered by the accountancy industry uh, as, and often you know, give, giving advice on how organizations can improve their performance, their economy efficiency and effectiveness and how they can maximize their assets. But very often how to financialize and capitalize. And uh, there's a whole, our chapter on the, the NHS is really a rather gloomy, depressing chapter on how, how public health has been captured by predatory for-profit financial uh, brokers who are trying to, um, yeah, who, who are trying to uh, find ways of uh, asset stripping and outsourcing. Um, and this is now happening to great effect in third world and developing countries. Um, I think I'll hand over to you, Sue, for the next slide. OK, so I get the um, the job of talking about well, who loses in this game. And uh, there's two key players here. One is the professionals themselves. Um, and we have a chapter about higher education where we show how the way in which the performance indicators continually keep shifting around as to what is getting counted uh, affect people's careers and their sense of their professional selves. 
And there's a we do a case study of the um, situation faced by Dame Marina Warner, who was uh, what, probably one of the best known professors of English in, in the UK, based at the University of Essex. And in 2014, she was asked to chair the very prestigious Man Booker Prize for Literature. Obviously, that kind of job is going to take it a year out of teaching. It's a full-time job um, to chair that committee and read the hundreds of books that get put forward. Um, so initially, her dean said, yes, accept it. That's highly prestigious. We'll cover your teaching. The vice chancellor wrote a letter of congratulation. Everything seemed fine. And then within a few months, she was presented with something called a tariff of expectations, which were 17 targets to do with teaching on which she would be assessed two times a year. So she said, um, what's going on? And between her being congratulated for uh, getting this chairmanship of the Man Booker Prize and being told that she would be released from teaching for the year, at that point, the research assessment exercise was the main source of funding for the university and the competitive funding. So if they had a higher prestige level in their research, they would get more funding. And of course, her prestige would be at the very top. But within a few months, um, the move had, had been made uh, that teaching was actually the main source of funding. Um, and so teaching, teaching, teaching became the buzzword and gaining student satisfaction, high student satisfaction scores for to attract fee paying UK students and to attract high paying foreign students was, was the name of the game. So suddenly she wasn't released from her teaching. She said, what do I do? They said, well, you could take a year's leave, unpaid leave, and then you can do the Booker Prize. The university will get all the prestige from that, which is nice, and then you can come back. And she thought this wasn't a way to behave as a university where a lot of people weren't in a position to be able to just take research leave when the accountancy system changed. So she resigned. She took on the Man Booker thing and uh, gave up her professorship at, at Essex. In that way, you can see how the fortunes of a highly prestigious academic are undermined by shifts and turns in the auditing system. The second example is with the public sector. And here we do a case study of the academy schools in the UK and show how professional judgment is undermined by what is called empowering users, but is really a, a way of opening up public sector schools to business interests. In um, 2010, um, academy schools um, were really expanded under the Conservative Liberal Alliance government. Um, and it was a way of um, moving schools away from local government control. Whenever a school was de deemed to be inadequate or failing, the Secretary of State then had the power to compel the school to be turned into a, an academy. And that meant that it would have a, either a private sector capitalist um, sponsor or a religious organization would sponsor it. And the sponsor would then have control of the curriculum, the staff pay and conditions. They could employ staff without teaching qualifications. They had quite a lot of control over the school. And initially, um, the sponsor had to provide two million pounds towards upgrading the building and the quality of the school. 
and the government would pay 90% of the costs of doing that. Um, in addition, once the school had been rebuilt or upgraded, the government would then pay an annual running cost to the sponsor uh, to cover the, um, the running costs of the school. There was a massive expansion of these kinds of academy schools. In uh, August 2010, there were 203 in the UK. By 2012, there were 2,000. By 2018, there were three times as many again. And by 2020, 77% of all secondary schools and 35% of primary schools were in this category of academy schools. Um, but at the same time, by 2012, the cases of fraud were beginning to be revealed. So there's a school in an academy school in Bradford, which the government had said was a flagship for the whole system, um, was given 10.5 million pounds by the government to upgrade. By 2013, 150,000 pounds had disappeared into the pockets of the principal and his sister and they were jailed. In 2016, Perry Beach's school in Birmingham had 1.3 million pounds funneled into a private company owned by the head who was getting 120,000 pounds in salary and 160,000 pounds as a top up to his salary. In 2015, Wakefield City Academy Trust, which had 14 schools um, and was given a £50,000 grant to upgrade and was called top performing in 2015. By 2016, the CEO was uh, found to have taken £82,000 for 15 weeks work without a contract and £44,000 for work on an IT company that he co-owned. He charged double the mileage rates for all his travel. And just to kind of be the cherry on the cake, he got £1,500 to build a pen for his dogs at the school. So um, at the same time, that Wakefield sit, uh, community Academy Trust, which had 21 schools in its uh, purview, instructed those schools to transfer the funds that parents had been raising through boot sales and such like for, to boost the, the students' uh, academic and educational facilities um, that, that totaled £1.5 million. Pounds with, they were told to transfer from their own budgets to a central account, but there was no money for upkeep or cleaning or cleaning. The, the, the teachers and the parents protested. Um, by 2018, to cut a short, long story short, the, um, the Academy Trust divested itself two days before the start of the school term which left the children without a school. Deloitte was paid £200,000 to wind up the academy, which was equivalent to 43 children's education for a year. And it was left in a condition which has been officially called a zombie school because it no longer had a sponsor. It no longer had uh, any way of operating. So this is the way in which this financialization of public sector and depending on, on uh, spurious accounting systems has undermined the professionalism, the professional judgment of the teachers and the head teachers, and also the accountability to the parents in what was claimed to be a new form of accountability. I don't think I'll say any more about it. But thanks, Sue. Yes, we're going to keep Thank going. You. We haven't got that yeah. much longer. Well, we've got two slides left, really. Great. Um, so how do we get out of this mess? <laughs> what are the ways forward? And so Chris and I have thought about ways forward on four scales. 
ways to assure quality, probity and accountability. And on the first one, we look at higher education and in particular use the work of Anke Schwitte at Sussex University, who's used spaces within her own capacity as a teacher to start developing new forms of education uh, that she feels are the kind of things that teachers, the, the students need. But with the problem with that is in higher education, often you can't expand beyond the small areas that the individual teacher has sway over. The second scale is but looking at a whole system change. And this is drawing on the work of Eileen Munro, who was appointed to chair one of the national commissions into child protection. And she showed that the previous systems that had relied more and more on computerization and removing the professional judgment from child protection was completely the wrong way to go. And she said that we have to build up a child protection system that's based on the relationship between the social worker and the child and the social worker and the parents. And to do that, you have to re-professionalize the social workers, trust them, build their education up so that they're making the best possible decisions. To do that, you have to have a community of learning amongst the social workers. To do that, you have to have a management system in the local authority, which is supporting the social workers rather than extracting spurious performance indicators out of them. To do that, the government has to change the way that it measures the local authorities. To do that, you have to change the national auditing system. And Ione Munro seems, I don't know how ever she managed it, but she seems to have talked to all of those scales and got changes across the whole system. Over to Chris. Yeah, so uh, another scale where we, I mean, we wanted to end the book on a much more constructive, positive note and, and where action is needed. And this is the, the reform of the audit industry, uh, which is, in a sense, it's crying out. It's way overdue. Um, as you probably know, just in the last couple of years, there has been a string of very, very high profile. Thank you. Of, of some major, major um, high street names. I'm thinking of Ted Baker, Kathy Valerie, British Home Stores. Uh, really the, the outsourcing uh, agent. I mean, and these were companies that literally weeks, months, if not weeks before, had been given a clean bill of health, they'd been audited. Uh, and despite that, you know, the companies, they they fell into um, into collapse. Um, and just for example, two, this is a finance, I'm an avid reader of the Financial Times as a result of this, but uh, this is just a few months ago. Uh, KPMG has been fined 1.5 million by the UK accounting regulator for, quote, serious failings in its audit of M&C Saatchi, one of Britain's best known advertising agencies. And it goes on to list all the other fines that um, KPMG have received. This was 14 days ago, Financial Times. Audit firms failed to raise the alarm before three, quarter, three quarters of big UK corporate collapses since 2010. This is 250 largest corporate companies that collapsed where they were audited by members of the big four. Three quarters of them failed to report anything wrong, raising concerns that auditors are failing to perform one of their core functions. This is from a report from the Audit Reform Lab run out of Sheffield University, which is a, is a wonderful group of uh, critical accountants there. Um, <clears throat> What is the government doing about it? There were four key reports, the Kingman report, the Bryden report. Um, the Labour Party uh, under Jeremy Corbyn came up with an absolutely wonderful report. They are basically concur on the recommendations. We need to split audit from accounting, uh, from the uh, additional services. Yeah. And the government claimed it was gonna do that. Under Kwasi uh, Kwarteng, it was silently dropped. Ernst and Young were going to, or PwC were going to do it, and but their new head has said, no, no, we're not going to go down that path anymore. It's too expensive. 
they say, don't worry, we've got a firewall between our advisory and our audit firm. So there's no conflict of interest. We we audit your books. We also provide you with advice on how you can uh, minimize your tax liability and so on. Um, but we do think that it's there are ways of doing that. And the, the Labour Party report did actually come up with the suggestion of a publicly owned um auditing company so it's not this isn't it's not dominated by for-profit private audit companies who are doing it for profit they have this reputation of being warriors of integrity who you know who watch the scan the horizon to ensure fair play uh, but they don't that's not their game at all and finally um we end with a kind of plea to let's replace audit with with democratic accountability and there's the work of judy brown at otago university in new zealand and she has a, a group, a network of what they call critical accountants who are basically trying to put forward an alternative form of accounting. And they call it social and environmental accounting or dialogic accounting. And it's basically the idea that, OK, we're not going to get rid of accounting. We still need audit. But let's let's count as um, let's count the things that matter and let's not dismiss a sort of subsidiary or out, out you know, collateral damage. Uh, things the damage to the environment and finally finally um our last slide is that we just sort of thought as a kind of a, a punchy way our the last end of our conclusion is what simple things that can be done and, and it's a number of five key points stop judging and making huge assessments based on a single number i mean this was one of the the conclusions of the the, the suicide of the head teacher who Ofsted had told uh, that your school was failing on one metric and she took her life. This was a school close to Oxford. Uh, narratives, not numbers. Encouragement, not punishment, because this whole system of audit is based on the idea that we will punish failure. We won't you know, give you a leg up. If you're, if you're seen to be failing, then, then you're out, which is why people cheat and push the system. Stop thinking of people and organizations as economic units of resource. These are people we're talking about, you know, not, not, not these sort of abstracted economic units. And unfortunately, so many HR departments do treat their staff as units of resource. We're going to redeploy you there. Um, rebuild public trust. We've lost it big time in this country. And then audibility, not hypervisibility. Let's move to a kind of a away from the optics of surveillance and have a more oral in the sense of hearing way i mean go back to the traditional meaning of audit which was a hearing a public hearing um anyway those are sort of, sort of simplistic ideas happy to uh, open it up to the to our discussants to, to to come on with with more thoughts about where to from here great chris and sue thank you very much that's a, um a, a real tour de force for the um um for us all to think about um, at this point, um, we are going to have a couple of couple of um, discussions, including myself. But Alice, would you like to start with some thoughts? Yeah, very happy to do that. Thanks, thanks, David. Um, and with apologies for the sound of my voice, I will try to project um, a bit. Um, so, thank you so much, uh, Chris and Sue. It's a fascinating and courageous book, and a formidable scholarly survey. Uh, but also a very good read indeed. Um, so thank you for that. Uh, and there's no way I can respond in a few minutes um, in a way that will do justice to the book. So what I want to do instead is just to share a few thoughts, questions, comments um, in no particular order. Um, so one of the things that um, um, following from your presentation that kind of struck me was um, um, the way in which public and client for different services, but public expectations um, may be shaped by educational institutions and by media and public communication, um, and perhaps leading to a kind of self-enforcing circle. And I'm just curious, you know, how may this circle be broken um, if audit devices like the ones you've described and critiqued have become such a pervasive, such pervasive cultural tropes already? Um, so that's one of the first kind of thoughts. Um, and then um, should I just continue? I've got maybe four or five such kind of questions that, that occurred to me. The second one is a bit more specific and it's um, it's uh, uh, brought up by the chapter on uh, which I read with 
huge interest by the chapter on universities and, and research and, and rankings and so on. Um, and it made me wonder about the role and the positioning of professional staff or administrative staff in universities. Um, because often there is a tendency to see them as enforcers of bureaucratic conformity and kind of managerial compliance. But is there more um, about this large number of, of colleagues across universities and the roles that they have than that? Um, and then third, uh, um, this is a, a, a slightly more simplistic question. Um, so you, you discuss some very powerful um, examples that, and very startling examples as well um, in different domains. But I do wonder if all of these examples are indeed examples of problems that are implicit, uh, uh, intrinsic to audit um, as a concept and as a practice. Or are they issues having to do with audit malpractice? Um, and where is the demarcation line there? Um, and then I kind of two final thoughts. So uh, inevitably, um, from kind of my own work as well, when listening to people's views on things like um, research assessments and the UK system of the ref and so on, there's a mix of views. Um, and many of the people I've interviewed over the years uh, are very quick to point out um, that things that they describe in rather positive terms and things that align with what they see as their values. Um, so, for example, things about um, strengthening research and legitimizing research as a pursuit in universities, the growth of open science and open research practices, um, EDI. Um, ethics, um, impact, all sorts of things that they say would not have necessarily happened within this time frame if they were left to be grassroots or through top-down institutional vision um, within each organization. So are these people wrong? Are they deceiving themselves? Are they caught in an illusion and not seeing that? And you know, on what grounds do we do we see through that you know, better than, than them? And then my final one is um, around the final chapter on which I dwelt a lot because um, I agree with so much of what you put in that in that chapter. Um, and uh, I like the examples of change that you've given and I like very much the idea of multiple scales that you have used. I think that's exactly the right way to think about this. Uh, and also I like the final principles that you shared on your, I think it was the final, the final slide with the different lines there. Um, but it made me wonder about two things. One is around individuals and one is around your kind of fourth scale. So on individuals, um, so some of the examples that uh, you've given in, in that final chapter as well, um, and also examples I've come across and collected over the years, have at their center as an agent of change, an individual figure. And sometimes that's a bit of a Joseph K who is ultimately crushed by the system. Sometimes it's a heroic figure of solitary action and, and resistance that maybe inspires others, um, even though they might not follow them. And sometimes it's a resourceful champion for strategic mobilization within an organization. But I'd be interested in hearing more about how the individual is theorized in, in your work in relation to your critique of, of audit. Um, and, and, and I just wonder, you know, is this tragic hero, the action figurehead, the organizational catalyst, are they a site of relationality? Are they a social atom? And are they indeed the main protagonists of, the, of change? So in, uh, this, this was prompted for me by uh, remem rem remembering a book that I read many years ago, which is called The Practice of Everyday Life. Uh, and it's by Michel de Certo. Um, which I think makes, there's lots of things going on in that book, but it makes a powerful point about how everyday practices and tactics of ordinary people um, can enact creative resistance and micro subversions of dominant orders and of institutionalized rituals and representations. Um, and I found that kind of a kind of interesting counterpoint to the more kind of heroic story of the, of the figurehead. And then finally, on your fourth scale, because um, I said that there was a point about an individual and about uh, one about the four scale um, and about the possibility, I think, of democratic accountability in a context of increasing banality of audit. So there's a quote um, in your final chapter. There's a, there's a, a sentence there that says that 
Um, the system of management by metricized objectives and governance through league tables must be replaced by one that builds confidence in professionals and their judgment. The challenge is to create and sustain more participatory and democratic forms of governance that restore trust. Uh, I couldn't agree more with the spirit of this. But I'd also wonder, you know, what makes this possible, given where we are and your account of how we arrived here with the quasi kind of inevitability of audit? And also, what is there to be restored, seeing as we're looking back over, you know, at least two centuries of, of the growth of audit? I mean, is there really an equitable distribution of trust to be restored from the past? Uh, or is it yet to be invented? <laughs> so thank you so much for listening to me. That's brilliant. Thank you so much, Alice. Um, really helpful set of comments. I am just going to um, bring up my own screen now so that everyone can see. Um, me, I'll just add a few comments as well. Um, it's not working, is it? Um, so while I'm while I'm doing this, I'll just say that um, perhaps Alice, if you if you have I spotlighted you somehow, I have. Um, Spotlight for everyone. Okay, so um, just to, to, to thank you, thank you again, Chris, and thank you again, Alice. Um, it's a pleasure to um, to welcome you all to, to this department and everyone in the room. I've wanted to to sort of uh, and I have cited your work for a long time and be inspired by it and and enjoyed thinking about it and even arguing with it. Um, the first thing to say, I think, is that it's it's been going for a long time, a lot longer than perhaps many of us. And realize that, that you know your first article was 1999, but you've been doing participant observation for a long time before that. I think in UK universities, um, so that you know that, that that's a good thing. I think in terms of you've got a lot of evidence to draw on and a lot of um, a lot of sort of insights from from that history. What I like about the book is there's dark humor and and the Kafka esque. Um, OMD, anyone? Obsessive measurement disorder. Um, but there's also a real poignancy here. And Chris, you mentioned the, the the suicide of the teacher who got outstanding in everything in her school other than her audit trail. And that, and, and those of you who came to the CGH webinar earlier this week, um, Emmanuel Kulczewski called written a book called The Evaluation Game. He too cited a, um, an Imperial College researcher who committed suicide because he wasn't meeting his metrics. Um, and that was his word. You know, that, that was exactly what how the university described what was going on. So so, so those are the very real, very tragic effects of of these cultures when they when they get out of control. Um, so your work's gone a long way. It, it, it's travelled. Your your it's been your that nineteen ninety nine paper has been cited a thousand times. Not that we're counting. <laughs> um, and I think what's 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 good about that early paper is you, you know it was the first time when you could really see what was happening as a result of the Thatcher government and the sort of the the, the creation of the audit commission, the the, the move to new public management. And this book, I think, takes off from that and goes so much further. Um, it's almost as if there's a policy palimpsest where layers upon layers of, of audit rationality sort of um, intertwine. I, I've been thinking a bit about the relationship between quantification and audit culture. Um, Theodore Porter's book, Trust in Numbers, he goes back in a second edition to work out just when this, this phrase, trust in numbers, comes about. And he reckoned, you know, he realizes that actually it's always used in a very negative way until about the 1930s. So it's only, it's only as you point out, with the rise of Taylorism and mass production and a sort of and a scientific modernity that numbers become trustable. Um, and then I was thinking about the, the ways in which the numbers that the OECD and UNESCO have created entangle us the field of global higher education within this as well, because global higher education only really becomes visible as a field through some of these numbers, through some of these rankings. So we've got a problem here in the, for our own research practices. How do we wean ourselves off of these numbers that enable us to see the, the higher education or educational spaces in, in certain ways? I think that's that's a real challenge for a lot of us working in education is how we disentangle ourselves from, from, these, from this. And if anyone doubts the power of these numbers, you only have to look at the FT's headlines, most of the headlines yesterday, the Q Q QS, Quackerelli Simmons' latest report, UK universities in decline, you know, it was all over the front pages of the papers. And um, so, so yet again, 
for all our criticisms of these ranking cultures, they have the power to sort of to um, make storylines. Your definition of audit culture is contexts where the principles, techniques and rationale of financial accounting have become dominant features of the way society is organized. OK, principles, techniques and rationale. I wonder where culture comes in here. OK, I mean, I know, I know it's an easy phrase, audit culture. But uh, but I think there is perhaps something in the in the everyday life thing that um, Alice commented on is you know how does this get entangled with cultures of everyday life in organisations, um, and and I think that that also links me to this question of of I don't think it's a cause effect argument you're making I don't think you're saying that the rise of ranking and quantification is directly attributable to financial accounting, but but I think what you're more saying is that once you create numbers you can then govern by them. that's the point isn't it I think so so there's a sort of diffusion effect what you call the governance effect which i really like and it's almost like there's a rationality creep isn't it the sort of the, the the logics creep between between sections so there's a book by pardo carrera called the quantified scholar where he writes about just how this is impacting uk university academics and i think what your book is great at is it goes beyond that and you know it is a bit relentless but you, you bring in lots of different contexts from well beyond universities finally i think it's great as, as alice says you want to reclaim audit um you say it can be used to create a genuine and accountable society. We don't need to abandon it, but we just need to return it to its primary mandate of ensuring probity and trust. So my question, possibly then, in relationship to that is this question of trust. Michael Gove famously said, we don't trust experts anymore, okay? But I actually wonder, what, what, what is part of what's going on here is that we're the wrong sort of experts, that actually the experts that that he's suggesting we trust are the experts of numbers, the number experts. And so that's the challenge that is to rebuild an expertise that doesn't rely on numerical indicators. So, so it is about trust and therefore it is about culture and it, a different sort of professional culture. And then finally, very finally, um, have we reached peak audit? I mean, you know, there, there, is, there are questions I think about universities saying we don't want to be ranked anymore. We don't want to be part of these, these ranking games. There are there are great statements about about you know the, the Barcelona Declaration saying we we want to be much more open about how we use these the research data. Um, can is that is there a possibility that actually we're now more and more aware of the the, the damage this has caused and we're, we're stepping back from some of its extremes? Um, but or am I just being overly optimistic and I ought to stay pessimistic in the good Gramsci Gramscian sense? But thank you very much again. Um, before I before I and it's to the audience, so you're all welcome to ask questions. Sue or Chris, do you want to respond to Alice's great comments or anything that I've said at this point? I'd love to, but Sue, I mean, I'm. Would you like to? Uh, would you like to go first, or shall I? I'd love to as well. But um, how are we doing for time? We want the audience to have some time as well. Yes, we've got twenty minutes or so left. So, to, if you get going, Sue, and then we can open. Okay. Up. Well, I think um, there's so many beautiful things that you've raised and lots of, you know, things to think about. I'm going to start with Alice's point about individuals, because um, I think what we do is we move around different ways of seeing the individual as constructed. Um, because one way is that, especially under the Thatcher governments, there was a, a, a real move to use governance technologies to reconstruct the individual into the enterprising individual, the competitive individual. There is no society. There is only the individual and their family. Um, so that individual becomes constructed, is implicit in a lot of the govern of the auditing systems. Um, the individual under Margaret Thatcher wasn't just the person as the individual, but also institutions were individuals. So individual hospitals were to compete with each other. Individual schools were to compete with each other. So the individual took on a whole new set of meanings as that move of audit into audit culture, into the public sector really took hold. And so I think one way is... is is that way of constructing the individual, um, the audit, auditization of the individual. And that fits with the way in which the um, 
that the, the, those technologies work across so many different scales at once. Um, and so the individual does get to know how that can reflexively see how they're being constructed, just as the West Point students could see how they were being ref reflexively how they were being constructed. Um, and uh, the against that, people never accept that or rarely accept that as the clothes that they're going to wear. We can be aware of the way that we're being constructed by a system, but we, there's always that space, the possibility to stand back from it, critique it, um, think about it differently. And that's where I think in the first two um, scales of the last chapter, the way forward, we're thinking about for example, the examples in higher education where people have stood back from, okay, I know I'm being measured in terms of ref, tef, and all the rest, but why am I here? What am I trying to achieve? This is what uh, David and I go back a long way with CSAP, really uh, thinking about how, how we can create space within universities for people to think, why am I here? What am I trying to achieve through my teaching and through my research? How can I create the space for maneuver within this organization to achieve that? And the problem there and the difference, I think, between the higher education example in scale one and the child care, uh, child protection in, in uh, scale two is the difference of the Times Higher Ed and the QS. The, so the child protection does not have that global ranking system um, that, that's acting as a straitjacket on a whole system. It is a national system. And therefore, Munro, as the professor who led that commission and thought about whole system change, could actually go and talk to all the elements involved in that whole system and think, OK, this is how you're constructing the field. This is how you're constructing the public authority, this is how you're constructing the individual and that whole thing has to change. So I think as David was pointing to that every now and then there's, oh, well, we're going to kind of, Cambridge says we're not gonna have anything to do with um, with rankings anymore. And we all go, yeah, 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 wait for it. Um, so there's there's continuously you know repeatedly you get these little mo movements where people are thinking we're going to get out of this system we have to get out of that system um and we have to and i've been saying this for years futilely we have to mobilize as academics and students on a massive scale and uh, and inform our leaders that we we have to move out of that system Good. I, I, I'm aware. Thank, thank you, Sue. I'm aware we should probably make some time for the audience, as you say. Is that okay, Chris? And um, or you, no, you can come in. You, you go next, then quickly. Okay, really quickly, yeah. because since you addressed that one, I just wanted to address the question. You, you, you're asking, is it audit or is it just audit malpractice? And mm -hmm. uh, you know, how can we restore trust? And uh, and you, you're right, David. We do want to reclaim audit. I think our argument throughout the book is that you know it, it's no, we have nothing wrong with audit. Nothing wrong with you know inspecting the books and ensuring that the numbers tally. It's the problem is that audit has become a, an organizing principle of society and a mechanism for governing and managing people. And that is where it's wrong. That's where it's the, the deformities come from. You can't use that yardstick in a successful way. And secondly, and, and Alice, I really appreciate your comments. I'd love to discuss them more, but it, Audit is not neutral. What we've noted, and you know, Michael Gove, uh, you're right, we are the wrong kind of experts. So audit is allied to a project of financialization. It's a new form of capitalism that we're dealing with. And that's why it's got so such powerful vested interests behind it. But it's not simply, oh, we need audit to improve our systems. It comes with a whole set of an assemblage, if you like, mm. of financial financializing mechanisms that are about extracting money and resources and assets from public sector organizations it's a machine hoover, hoovering up um value from the public yeah. so yeah sorry no, 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 no. that's good thank you yes yeah 
Um, we've got quite a few questions online, um, so I will invite those people to come forward. But anyone in the room who wants to ask a question, please also hands up. Okay, so what I might do is I might alternate between online and in the room. Um, Felipe, um, do you want to start? You asked the question about how the Big Four became so big and, and powerful. Yeah, thank you. Just uh, because it came in the first few slides, I was quite intrigued by how have the Big Four become the fount of all knowledge? How have they become all things to everyone? Uh, I mean, they started as auditors, right? So how are they producing uh, or, or giving advisory to 20, 30 different industries? Where's the knowledge coming from? Why are people deferring to them for advice for all sorts of things? I mean, when Brexit happened, for example, the government went to the big four for advice on Brexit. What do they know? How do they know this? So I'm just uh, kind of trying to understand where where this perception comes from uh, that they are so clever, intelligent, or the fount of all knowledge. Is it the, is it the audit side of things that helps them understand the inner workings of a company? Because I kind of feel it's all related. So if any insights on that would be useful. Thank you. Do you want to go for that one? Yeah, well, very quickly. I mean, we do have a whole chapter that is how the big four got big and it tracks the history. And two answers to your question, really. One is that it, it was a state guaranteed market um, when the legislation went through saying that every company organization should be audited. And so these were fairly small companies. They were always international, but then they became truly global on the back of this. You don't have many other professions that have a state guaranteed market. But also they'd reached the point where they, their size alone guarantees them success. Because I mean, I was talking to an auditor just a couple of weeks ago in Australia. He said, how many organizations can bring together expertise from management, from HR, from finance, from IT? And we can deliver a whole package of services to an organization. 99% of the financial type FT100 are companies. Now it's 100% are audited by the big four. The same with the, you know, the, the, the stock exchanges of most companies. They, they, they just have the expertise and the capacity and they have this kudos now to do it. So they're, and, and also there's this danger now that when Arthur Anderson collapsed after the Enron scandal, uh, we used to have the big five, now it's the big four. And one of the legitimate fears is that if you, prosecute KPMG for major audit failings and corruption, you're simply concentrating the problem into the big three. So we've got a you know, quadrupoly will be reduced to a, a, a smaller monopoly. And we can't mm. have that. Mm -mm. Good. Okay. Uh, so, so, so the answer there is partly read the book. There's more, much more detail in the history there. Um, question from the room, Jeremy. Uh, two... General question so far, but to think of one concrete case, quite honestly, as far as I can remember, I think your choice of Marina Warner as an example of what goes wrong is really unfortunate because she's a very atypical academic. This is a person with a popular reputation uh, or her non-academic reputation is bigger than her academic one. This is a person who entered academia, well, who came out of academia after her doctorate uh, and then went back into it in the late middle age, for whatever reason, uh, to uh, take this chair in Essex. She then is given this prestigious position. And I'd like to know the arguments against Essex saying, oh, if you've got this prestigious position for a year, which comes with a big salary, well, then you just take the for a year. I don't see the argument against that, if you can tell me. And the other one is, is she then resigns because of the pressures of this. It could be interpreted in very different ways. It could be, this is actually um, a rather greedy person who wanted two salaries to do one job for a year, who has sufficient prestige outside of academia that she can get out easily. In that sense, I don't think she's a great song, but show me I'm wrong. Okay, so this is, this is online, if you can hear, the question is, the Marina Warner example, is that a good example? Do you want to do you want to do you want to respond to either of you um I, I couldn't hear the question so okay, okay fine so so the question the question was around the example you used of marina warner as someone who was um who left and wrote very powerfully about leaving the academy i think that was part of the point wasn't she she wrote very powerfully about it she, what we do have other examples of other sort of more more humble academics who have been hounded out or, you know who've been but I, I think the point with the illustrative point 
mean, you, you may be right, Jeremy, that you know that she is uh, the, the less sort of deserving for, of our sympathies. But that we used it because it was a perfect illustration of how the metrics, the goalposts keep changing. And when you think you've performed and delivered to one, uh, it, it's what Peter Fleming says in his book, um, Dark Academia, How Universities Die. The reason why there's so much anxiety in higher education now is that there are so many systems of metrics by which we are being judged and evaluated that there's bound to be at least a few in which we are always going to be failing. And that's what's happening. And so, uh, yeah, OK, I accept your point, but it's, uh, yeah, she, I think she's illustrative of a, of a wider problem uh, in higher education. Yes, then, the thing is that, you know, I wouldn't disagree with you about there are so many metrics that we can't really be expected to succeed on all of them. But once that is generally known, then I think we should come out. Sure, we can fail in certain ways. Mm -hmm. And so long as we remind the hierarchy of that, Okay. Okay. Um, yeah. So, so the interesting question: we, we, you know, the, the the metrics that we know we need to play by, and the metrics we don't. Um, let's come back to this perhaps afterwards because it's quite hard to hear you from the back of the room. But um, can I ask um, Liz Holding, who is on the call? She, she 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 you mentioned a letter from a teacher. Do you want to um, say a bit more about that because you had quite a few responses. Yes, I, I hadn't anticipated that it would uh, it would be quite so popular. Um, I, I read it the other day on my uh, my Apple News feed, and I was very struck by um, how how much of a synergy there was. So basically, it's it's um, a letter from a teacher called Terry Swainsbury on the twenty eighth of May, twenty twenty four, to the Independent, and um, he is talking about. Um, Paula Venel's management style. And he, he comments on the fact that um, she said to the post office inquiry that she failed to recognize the imbalance of power between the institution and the individual, um, and therefore she felt she'd let people down. But his, his critique there is that um, what he's saying is, well, you know, there's this obsession over um, things that we can measure, so performance metrics, things that we can measure, and a complete lack of humanity. He also refers to um, the example of the, um, the, the head teacher who unfortunately took her own life following an Ofsted inspection. But he concludes by saying um, that he left teaching because he was immersed in a world of value-added appraisal and performance. And he just felt that the professionalism of teaching had been eroded. Yeah. Um, I think I think there's, there's nods of agreement, I think, here. Mm. Um, Liz, th th yeah, thank you for that. Um, I, I think the connecting the post office scandal, which was you know, similarly a sort of an example of a failure of of audit sc scrutiny. And a PPP. Absolutely. Yes. OK. <laughs> so there's yet another case for Chris to add to his next edition. <laughs> um, another question in the back. Can you speak up, then we can hear online. I'll shout. Please. Um, I want to give an example of a non-perverse use of auditing. I had a friend who worked in an anthropology department in Britain, and they got a new professor. And the new professor um, got uh, everybody's CV and then read at least one of their books, most recent books, or several articles of theirs, scheduled appointments with each of them, established in an hour and a half's talk with each, where they felt they were getting behind or they were getting blocked or they were unable to do the work that they wanted to do, worked out what was within their capacities to produce as a piece of work to get themselves moving again over the next two years, mm. and then allocated all teaching leave and research time so that those people who had achieved the least would have the most time in which to catch up and therefore rescued the one or two or three people who exist in every department who are demoralized and trapped and scorned by their colleagues. And that's a way that you could use it mm -hmm. throughout the system. Because the thing about audit is it's one way, it's down. Yeah. There is nobody filling out a whole bunch of forms on the head of the post office mm -hmm. or Michael Go. Can I yeah. answer that one? Because I think this is a really important uh, point. What you're describing is not audit, you're describing management. 
and are absolutely in favor of good management where you treat people as humans, you see them trying to do their best, you explore with each person what they're trying to achieve and you find out, you work out how to use the existing resources to support them and enable them to achieve what they're trying to achieve. That is good management. It's not depersonalized numbers which are then used to control people. So what you're describing is an example of excellent management. I wish I was in that department. Our leaders just closed our department because of a number. Um, you're talking about chalk and cheese here, and I think it's great to have examples like the one you've just given us. Good. Okay, thank you. There's a, um, Yaren, you, 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 you asked the question next, and you've got your hand up. Please come in. Yeah, thank you, David. Thank you very much. And thanks, Chris and Sue, for this wonderful book. I really love the idea of audit capitalism. And my question is about the last point, narratives, not just numbers. According to my interview experience with Chinese scholars who are under the same kind of pressure of the Chinese version of REV, they complain that the narrative case study have two big problems. The first one is that it costs them much more time to write the case study. Like in China, they were only required to submit an 800 words report, but it may cost two to three months of drafting, revisiting and rewriting. But compared with that, numbers are readily available. And secondly, people can also game with those narratives because the academic circle is mm. really small. So the panel can guess which HEI the case study is coming from. And this brings huge disadvantage to small HEIs and HEIs in competition, such as Oxford and Cambridge. So my question is how you understand this phenomenon and uh, do you have any idea, especially about how to balance between the narratives and the numbers? Thank you very much. Great question, Yaran. Thank you. Um, Sue or Chris, do you want to have a go, go at that? I can have a go if you like, Chris. Okay, go for it. Yeah, I think this is a really important point. The question to my mind is whether those narratives are being used for auditing or whether they're being used for narr narrating. And I think that's the distinction that Chris and I are trying to make in the book. And it comes back to this notion of management again, because the, 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 the way in which audit came in with what's called new public management is that, that phrase is actually what it means. It's a new form of management, which is a top-down controlling management using disembodied numbers and I think you can turn narratives into disembodied narratives as well. Um, so the question is not so much whether you need a narrative to start setting all the Chinese universities in competition with each other and all the faculties within the Chinese univer each university in competition with each other. The point is, if we're trying to develop a, a strong sector, have a system of funding which provides, as uh, the, the management example just gave, the way for the weaker to get stronger. Don't use it punitively. Have it either equally or disproportionately to the weaker to get stronger. And then have a system of management where you're using, uh, getting to know each other, talking to each other, making, telling stories about what you're doing but within a local scale and within a supportive environment. That's a completely different system than using either numbers or narratives to set up a comp competition between units that and disembodied numbers that are then used to clout people. Good. Um, numbers that clout. Okay, so we're running out of time and we, we mustn't oh, 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 stay too long because um, you've all been very patient, but we're going to ask two, more, two last questions online. Deepti, you had a question about Indian higher education and David about um, the impact, the long-term impact. So perhaps both of you could could speak and then we can wrap up quickly. Deepti. Thank you. Uh, so uh, thank you for the talk. I was thinking of the ways in which, uh, you know, uh, quality and quantity are intertwined concepts in academia. 
especially in Indian academia, where, you know, the beginning of the policy language with respect to higher education started with the idea of equity. Let's bring as many numbers of students into the university, which eventually led to a conversation on quality. Now that the students are in, the quality of education is declining. So we must start monitoring. And given that education at large, especially in India, has had a history of uh, you know, caste privileges being embedded into education um, to a large extent, upper caste academics have been uh, in and around the system. And it's only in the, let's say the 80s and the 90s, right when, of course, audit culture was happening everywhere else that we had reservations happening here so that lower caste communities could come in in large numbers. So I was just thinking that as much as I see the potential in narratives uh, you know, in the case of narratives becoming a form of judgment that could be utilized in academia. I also see that in this case, there is a certain kind of democratic potential that came with numbers. Uh, universities at large in, uh, in India, for instance, because of the sheer numbers of students that were coming from low caste communities, there was a certain form of uh, democratization of campuses at the level of, uh, you know, conversations on discrimination, conversations on what is merit in itself. Um, I, I'm just curious to understand what your take is because, you know, my PhD is looking at the pursuit of quality in education. Like, what do we mean when we say we're looking, searching for quality? Um, and since you are coming at it from the point of audit, um, I thought it would be useful to hear what you feel about this. Okay, th thank you very much, Titi. That's a great question. Um, and the very last um question really i think for today is from david david greenwood do you want to come forward you're muted david there. You... Yeah. You hear me? yeah great okay it's a banal question but we haven't actually said anything much about the students and since this is this pervasive worldview in, in which institutions in which the students live every day of their lives under people who are dealing with these kinds of stresses and so on, uh, we don't know very much about the long-term effects on students and their, their attitude about education, their choice of courses, um, the idea of whether it's worth going. I mean, we, we're seeing in the United States numbers of students dropping quickly aside from the demographic cliff, it's faster than the demographic cliff. Uh, and there are a few books out there, Kern's Lost in the Meritocracy and Lenny Guineer's Tyranny of the Meritocracy that suggest things, but we don't really have good qualitative research on students, what they hear, what they perceive, uh, how they understand the hidden curriculum uh, behind these kinds of activities. And, and perhaps what their expectations are of good management, as you've been describing it, which I like. So as I said, just a simple point. You set up a, a nice project, research project to a defil or two there, I think, um, um, David, thank you very much. Um, we're, we're running over, so very last word from Chris and Sue before we, before we wrap up. Chris, do you wanna go first? Yeah, sure. Um... Thanks for and uh, thank you for those, those questions. We haven't had time to address all of them. I, I, you're right to highlight the importance of the, the figure of the students. Uh, that is, and uh, you know, I think in the experience in audits, the student is typically spoken for and does not have much of a, a, a meaningful voice. Uh, mm. Now we've reified this concept of the student experience, and we have a whole series of metrics at universities that have to dance to. to mm -hmm. But when and how students were ever consulted about their their views of good management, I think you're onto something. A really important point. Um, as for the future, you know, it's I, I think the book is really just trying to. I mean, yes, there, there are there are counter arguments all the way, and it can't be too extreme. We're not against numbers. We're not against metrics. We're not against um, quantitative measures of, of way of trying to evaluate quality, but we are trying to offer a warning about what can happen, what, what is happening as a result of this kind of fusion, this combination, this obsession with measuring, this obsessive measuring disorder, or, or obsessive counting disorder, I like to call it, OCD in a new, new version. 
Um, and and the, um, the confluence with these forms of financialization and capitalism. And I think ultimately we're all going to be losers in this unless we, we really do need to do something quite urgent to, to stop, think, halt the process, reverse some of it. And yeah, I, and I do think the, re the restoration of, I know that professions got a bad, a bad publicity, a bad press in the wake of Harold Shipman, you know, did carnage to the medical profession. Um, what's her name? Lucy Letby has done carnage to the, the, the nursing profession. But on the whole, these are very isolated, small incidents. And we mustn't then obliterate self-governance in these professions simply because we can no longer trust our professions. Mm -hmm. And the definition of a professional are people who set the standards by which they will be judged and evaluated and i think some sort of mechanism maybe it's a combination of narratives and numbers of self-evaluation and external um validation and scrutiny is it, the answer but definitely not what we've got at the moment too so yes very last word yeah i think uh Dutti's, uh point about quality is is absolutely one of the central issues here quality of education at least in higher education, I don't think has ever been capable of measurement. Quality of education for me is inspiring students to think otherwise, to get them excited about ideas, to think of the world they're in and how they can make it different, alternative. The things that are used to measure quality are called proxies, proxy measurements, like do your students stay in the class or do they walk out the door? Well, it might be they've got stomach ache. Um, so I think actually that's a really good example of the futility of audit. If you really want a system that is really developing quality higher education, then you go back to the example we give you of the child protection where the essence of quality relation, the essence of quality child protection is the relationship between the uh, social worker and the child. That can be described. Both parties can describe how they feel, but you can't turn it into a measurement. And then what they've done, what they're trying to do is build a whole system of management and support around that reprofessionalization of the social work. And I really value that example as really a, a way forward. And we could use it, we can you transfer that kind of message over to higher education and think, how do we build up a relation of quality between the staff and the students? And what form of community of scholars do we need? What kind of management do we need? What kind of governance do we need? What kind of accountability do we need? And it would be a totally different system to the one we've got at the moment. Brilliant. Um, I think I think we should wrap up. You, you, you've given us a, a, a manifesto and a vision, Sue and Chris. Thank you very much for for, for um, all the work for, for for bringing us all together here. Um, for those of us who are in the room here, please stay. And uh, Chris, I'm sure would love to chat and. Um, we can even have some, some something in the sunshine outside. Um, for those online, thank you for coming. Please do um, come back to see this recording and the slides and everything. They'll be on, on the CG website. Um, and thank you for hosting us, David. Pleasure. Good. Thank you very much. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye.